Thank you for allowing the Wisconsin MECFS Association time to speak. Pat Farrow is not here, but I have worked with, on this with her together, and she wants to say that she is part of the um, Let's Get It Right group. We have known about myalgic encephalomyelitis since 1934. It was finally named myalgic encephalomyelitis in the mid-50s after having been called atypical polio. It was classified in neurology by the World Health Organization in 1969. In the mid-1980s, a series of mysterious cluster outbreaks of diseases occurred across the nation. At first, because many cases seemed to start with a bout of EBV, they called it chronic Epstein-Barr virus. That was actually the first name of this organization, the Wisconsin Chronic Epstein-Barr Virus Association. But common thinking at the time was that if you had an acute case of a virus and then you were immune to it, you wouldn't get it again. So there really couldn't be such a thing as really chronic Epstein-Barr virus. And uh, NIH decided that there was nothing wrong with the immune systems, that they didn't really have chronic Epstein-Barr virus, and uh, Steve Strauss, who was at the time NIH's head, um, expert on chronic fatigue, on, I'm sorry, chronic Epstein-Barr virus, in 1986 uh, asked to rename it to chronic fatigue syndrome. This is the earliest use of chronic fatigue syndrome I can find. Um, for the next three decades, what little funding NIH has allocated has gone to fatigue studies, or studies of stress hormones, stress, fatigue, fatigue and pain, fatigue and pain clinics, fatigue, pain, and sleep. Over at CDC, the first demographic efforts came with a figure of 10 to 50,000 patients with CFS, all white upper middle class women, yuppies overdoing trying to have it all, curiously because they went and looked at patients who'd been to doctors. I see we did the same thing again. We got the same results from looking at patients who go to doctors. It's the patients who have the money who can go to doctors, and that's not representative of patients as a whole. Now, nearly 20 years ago, Congress asked CDC to do a study on children and adolescents with this disease. CDC spent the money on other projects and got in trouble with Congress. The money was reinstated, but not the projects. Dr. William Reeves, in charge of CFS at CDC, explained he didn't think enough school-aged children and teenagers got the disease to warrant a study. In 1999, Leonard Jason and a team at DePaul found that roughly 800,000 American adults probably had the disease, and the disease was equal opportunity, all income groups, all ethnicities, which means that the yuppie theory could be thrown out entirely, and there has been nothing to contradict that. So that's a concern with what you found with this other study if all you found is basically yuppies. In 2003, Canada adopted its version of ICD-10, which included CFS with ME in neurology. A committee was convened of clinical experts, including several from the United States. The result is the Canadian consensus criteria. It does an admirable job of capturing the complexity of this illness. In 2004, SIFSAC recommended to the Secretary of HHS that the United States adopt the Canadian consensus criteria. And that's when we found out what happened to the money that was supposed to have been spent on the studies of children and adolescents and also on pregnant women. They had gone to annual conferences held in secret at a posh resort by CDC and people who had been invited, and according to Bill Reeves, they had come up with a new international definition. Eventually, that devolved into a set of questionnaires that Reeves said operationalized the Bakuda definition, but it didn't really do that either. Comparing the Canadian criteria with Reeves' questionnaires, Leonard Jason found that Reeves lost the bottom 30% of patients, the sickest patients, and also included patients who had primary mood disorders. Researchers have never used the Reeves questionnaires, to my knowledge, outside researchers. So the funds and the time were wasted. It's ironic, ironic that the name CFS replaced was chronic Epstein-Barr virus. And that the study of fatigue and stress replaced the study of viruses and immune systems, because that's where the research is now. A study published in PLOS One just a week ago shows that three-fourths of CFS patients have a deficient EBB-specific B and T cell response. I think the dismissal of chronic viral infections may have been premature. Recent research has also shown that 80% or more of CFS patients suffer from chronic infections of CNV, HHV6, and or HHV7. There are also studies on Coxsackie B. Patients have been found to have abnormal natural killer cell functions, abnormal 37 kDA RNA cell, and abnormal cytokine patterns. They have abnormal spec scans, abnormal CPET tests, which other people have discussed. Let me just say that what the CPET test, testing comes down to is that when sick, we operate in anaerobic metabolism most of the time. So just getting up and walking across the room, for me, when I'm at my sickest, I'm in anaerobic metabolism when I'm doing that. It's like I'm running down the street. 
not walking across a room. So it's not a good idea to make people do that. And yet that's what they're doing. Graded exercise when the subject is sick with a serious virus and operating in anaerobic metabolism is dangerous. I can't get that across more specifically than that. With so many ongoing research projects, is it any wonder that 50 experts signed a letter asking HHS not to go ahead with this at this point? If you happen to create a more heterogeneous definition and name, something like multi-system disorder, for example, will applications for NIH research funds and NDA applications require the researcher meet the new definition? That would set research back terribly. These studies are consistent with what I personally have. I have the immune defects. I have the chronic viruses. I even had active HHV6 and cytomegalovirus in my spinal fluid. What a coincidence that I had all the symptoms of encephalitis. I'm only able to stand here and speak to you because I'm on an experimental immune modulator and have been for 10 of the past 15 years. If I lose it, within six months, I'll be bedridden again. An entire generation has gone by since CFS was adopted in 1988. I have friends who first became ill when they were teenagers and they are now in their 40s and they are still sick. Their entire lives has been spent with this disease. We, need, we don't need to go back to the drawing board. We don't need to start over again. I don't want to see another generation lost the way that generation was lost, left invisible. We have biomarkers. We have them now. We have tests that could be done. Instead of going once again, going through the subjective symptoms and seeing what biomarkers fit them, can we do it the other way around for a change? Let's see who has these viruses like I do and what their symptoms are. Wouldn't that be a better way of doing the same thing? And it's, we are the drunks. The symptom thing is the drunks looking under the, the light where it's easy to, to, to find out what people have. But we don't need to look under the light anymore for the keys to the car. We have a way. We have a flashlight. We have objective testing now. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about children and adolescents. That has been mentioned. But let me tell you, imagine a 16-year-old girl with the same immune defects and the viruses that I had. Imagine a 16-year-old girl with, Eps with HHV6 and cytomegalovirus in their spinal fluid. I was bedridden by these symptoms. I could not read. I had expressive aphasia, ataxia, confusion, disorientation, paralysis, and blackouts. I had constant pain in the back of my neck, back of my eyes, and frequent severe headaches. My muscles hurt all the time. What do you think that would be like for a teenager? We have no studies into what this disease does to a growing body and a growing brain. We don't know because we've never spent the money on it. Why aren't we spending the money on it? We don't need to be defining it. We need to be finding out what's going on with it. We need to be past this. You've had it for 30 years. Move on. OK, the last thing I want to say, uh, they've already been said that non-medical laypersons use what's on the CDC's information page as a bludgeon against families and children with this disease. The CDC's information page says, use graded exercise. It says, uh, it says that young people have excellent prognosis and will get well. None of this is true, and all, some of this is bad advice. The graded exercise is extraordinarily bad advice. Again, as I told you, anaerobic exercise and a growing brain and a growing body and severe viruses. This is not a good combination. Why are you doing this? OK, uh, all right, let me say this. On July 4th, 1995, Casey Farrow died of myocarditis, a massive heart attack. He was 23 years old. Casey was a good kid. He did what people asked of him. People around him said, you're not really sick. CFS doesn't really exist. So he tried, got a job. He was lifting weights. He was um, applied to go back to school. And he died in the sleep of myocarditis. For years, his heart was dying, old scarring and new. And they were just and all, the only diagnosis he ever had was CFS. How many other kids out there are like Casey? We have no idea because we've done no studies. We've given no money. Um, this is a national public health catastrophe. And you need to address it with urgency, not by going back to the drawing board 30 years ago. We have biomarkers. We have tests. We need to move on past where we were before. Thank you for your time.
Thank you very more, much for your uh, impassioned presentation. Does, uh, do any of the committee members have a question that you would like to ask? Well, thank you. I mean, that was really extremely helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our, our final presentation is another one over the phone from, or over whatever, uh, from Jenny Spatilla of Occupy CFS.